The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. So, my name is um, Jose Pepe Izquierdo, I'm from Puerto Rico, structural engineer. I passed everything here in ACA. And um, I'm going to talk about um, uh, simplified design for reinforced building, and I'm going to talk about a little bit of technology that will help us do it. Take some time, ACA still use R RGB connections for computers. But it's a long way. When I started making a presentation at ACI, we use slides. And you carry your slides in boxes from your hometown. Then you come to ACI and you have to to the speaker ready room and you get a carousel. And then you have to put the slides in the carousel. And then you check them up that you haven't put them uh, upside down, <laughs> etc. So we, I'm going to talk about a simplified design uh, uh, for you this morning. Okay, there's some history about it. Some time ago, uh, 15 years ago, Colombia developed a document called Simplified Design and uh, Concrete Buildings, and ACI adopted it as, a, as an international publication and was called IPS1. This was during the Jim Jirsa presidency. And when it's a document developed by the Colombian Earthquake Association and by the, what is the equivalent of ASTM in Colombia. The reason uh, was to count, to fight a little bit about the complexity of 318. As you know, uh, last year, 318.14 uh, came out as a simplified way to handle 318 itself. But then in the United States, for example, 90% of the buildings that are built are less than five stories high. And, and the 318 is great for doing the Chicago and the New York buildings and et cetera. But uh, in, in the rest of the United States and in the world, that is, is quite complex. So this, this document uh, was developed in order to provide full compliance with 318, but following uh, a simplified procedure. It's low, low rise buildings, simplified strength method, materials available everywhere. And in the same guide, you have load analysis, design, geotechnical and construction all in one document. This is, so it's not, limit, not limited to the 318 content, content itself. It, it attains, for those who are in earthquake regions, earthquake resistance through a system of concrete walls. is automatic code compliance. If you follow the recommendations of the guide, you're fully compliant. And one of the beauties of it that now 318 has a lot of them are figures. You, you can sit down, there's plenty of chairs. There, there's not going to be a quiz at the end, so don't worry about it. So that, it has a lot of figures, and those of you who follow 318, I strongly recommend that you look uh, in, the, in, in the ACI bookstore, the, the new SP17, uh, which is a design handbook, that is a companion to 318. Lots of lots and figures, too. One of the things that uh, this, this manual has is the, the, the order of the book follows the design process. One of the changes of 318 was inspired by this book uh, to have a chapter of a column, so you don't have to go to five chapters to be able to design a column or, or, or six chapters to design a beam. So this document is that way, and it's, it's developed in such a way that you could actually design the building by using a hand calculator, which we are not promoting that you use the hand calculator. You can use spreadsheets or whatever you, you feel like, but, but the truth is it's, it's simple enough to be able to do it. Then I'm going to keep showing you different stuff that is available for those of you, of you who use tablets or, or smaller computers. So I'm going to show you briefly because um, I, I, I'm not going to go deeply into it. It's several programs that are available, for example, for the iPad uh, in, in the Apple uh, store. 
that are extraordinary programs. And, and the, the beauty of it is all of them cost less than $30. Some of them cost $5. Some of them are for free. Uh, this program, which is uh, reform, uh, Reinforced Concrete, RC Design HD, is a beautiful program. We'll, we'll see in a while some examples. And it does beams, it does brackets, etc. and it costs $9.99. It's a beautiful program. I have checked it. Results are okay. This is another more technical beam design, and we'll, I'll show you some calculations of this program. The other one is a beautiful program, it's foundations to, to, the, to do square, rectangular footings, etc. This one is for retaining walls, which I'm not covering today because this is not my topic today. This is our, uh, the most beautiful uh, structural program for, for iPad. Uh, it's the more expensive, yes, this is $29.95. But in the first design you do, you already cover the price. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's called retaining walls. The program, there's plenty of seats up here, sir. No quiz, you can sit down. The program will, you can increase sizes just with your hand. It will automatically calculate the bars, the stability, show you the moment diagrams, the pressure diagrams, everything. And when you're satisfied, and, and you will know you're satisfied just looking at the graphic, then you say print it, and then it'll give you five pages of actual calculations like you have done it. <laughs> 25 95 first one, you're done. Then the, there's some, this is a, uh, which I'm not covering today, it's a, a free program by the National Pavement Association for Mixed Design. And I'm going to show you a, a little bit about this uh, sketch a frame. I, I'm, I'm in love with that program, it's for free. And this is the ACI um, University, which I strongly recommend everyone to have it. Whatever topic you want to check, failures on cheer, repairs, analysis, design, whatever, it has, you can get every document ACI has on the website through that application of, uh, of ACI University. Okay, so let's go to general. This book has some limitations. It's for standard buildings. It's not for uh, a summer dream of an architect. If it's, the structure is a summer dream for the architect, this book will not comply because there are certain rules to it. It's up to five stories. Uh, it can have an additional basement. Maximum area is 10,000 square feet. Story height, 13 feet. Maximum span, 30. Uh, there can be a 20% difference between spans. Uh, minimum number of spans two, et cetera. And all these rules are because there's a lot of simplification in the process, so there needs to be certain redundancy. That's, for example, why a minimum of, of three spans, uh, of two spans are, are required, because there's, there needs to be some stability and redundancy on the product, et cetera. So uh, simple rules. And, and one of the beauties of, the, of this guide is that it has sketches and sketches all the time so that you follow what you're doing. And, and one of the first things that my, the first person that taught, taught me how to do structural design, you have to draw the structure in your, own, in your own terms. You see the architectural plans. You cannot do a model by looking at the architectural plan. You have to go and do your own sketch. And, and what I wanted to point out, uh, obviously you have to be sure of the dimensions, et cetera, openings is that you really have to go through and, and, and make a decision what the load path is going to be. Because for, in order to be able to design, you have to follow the load path. So this man, or this guy, has, is like, a, like a, a pilot in an airline. It's, they are experienced, but every time they sit at the cockpit, there's a list of things they have to check. So this guide is made in a way that for each step that you're following through, there's a checklist. Have you done this? Have you done the other thing? So it's really helpful. Looking forward to engineers that maybe don't do designs every, every year, but maybe every three years there is design for him. He can take this manual, follow the procedure, fully comply with 318. Okay? In terms of load combinations, et cetera, the manual has the same formulas. Uh, IBC promoted ASC7, and then uh, ACI adopted on the, on the factors and load combinations for the design of the building. For, for those of you who have no hair or have gray hair like me, no hair, the, you remember that the multiplication factors were different some time ago, 1.4 for dead loads and 1.7 for live loads. So that has been non -con in inconsistency with the other codes, and then um, the fee factors are adjusted to, 
get the same amount of level of safety. Another beautiful thing about this guide is that since it's self-contained, it has pages and pages and pages of loads, of weights, different stuff. Not only for all kinds of materials, as, as you can see he, here, bronze, brass, wood, iron, mortar, etc. It has weights for materials like, do you have a, a CMU wall made out of concrete with some of the cells grouted and some not? And they, they will give you, if your reinforcement is at 32 inches, this is the weight of the wall. If your reinforcement is at 16 inches, so depending is four, six, eight inches, 10 inches. So it's full, full data of weight, so uh, the designer doesn't have to go around uh, Googling uh, more information. Uh, it has uh, about eight pages of, of dead loads. In terms of seismic loads, for those people who are in areas that, and that are seismic uh, uh, sensitive, what the guide does, it, it solves the problem with a dual system that there is a, a full uh, three-dimensional uh, frame to resist the, the axial loads, and then there's the walls, concrete walls, to resist the earthquake. And, and there's a combination of both that makes the building safe. That's why it's called a dual building system. The other thing is that those of you who are familiar with, with ASC7, it used to be a 10-page a document. Now it's, I don't know, 200 pages, something like that. And, you have to do a doctoral thesis every time you develop what is the earthquake response for a building. And here is a, it's a one formula we do it. This is the response spectrum diagram in terms of period and, and, and acceleration. And what it does is say, you know, if we are doing low rise buildings, we're putting walls into it. It means it's going to be with a short period. It's not going to be a high period because the, the way the structure is laid out is a small building. Therefore, you know, there is a maximum area for that short period. So forget about the, this area inclined. Let's do a flat line. So you, you, you calculate using the, the site factor. And this is a, a common number now uh, at, for, for ASC7 and, and other documents and, and, and soils report if, if you are in an earthquake region, they will give you what is your, size, your, your site factor, I'm sorry, which will be uh, determined, uh, uh, and the manual, the guide has a, a chart that depending on the type of soil that the building is being constructed, whether it's a, a swamp, or is it, where is it on top of rock, and whatever is in the middle of that, there's a, a table on that. You will, you will enter there with what is the, the, the ground peak acceleration for, for the area, and it will give you the, the value of the, of the soil response. And then you multiply that by 2.5 times ground peak acceleration for, for the area, and it will give you the elastic uh, acceleration response spectra for 5% damping in, in percentage of the gravity. So that you can just multiply that by the weight over the resistance factor. And for this type of building, ASC 75, so it's five always just shown there to we maintain the same type of formula. So it's very simple. You calculate then that way the, best she the base shear, and, and basically the distribution is done by, by the classical rally formula, which is uh, some charts in there. So basically, because of being a dual system, what the ASC7 requires is that even though you have the walls to resist the earthquake motion, uh, uh, the frames will be designed for 25% additional load. So there's a redundancy the way you design those systems. And if you have any questions, don't, don't ask them. Don't, don't wait until the end. So this is the beautiful program I, call, I, I, I showed to you. And I discovered it about a month ago. And it's called Sketch a Frame. And I think this is the best teaching tool I have seen in years about structural behavior. Uh, it, it doesn't give you the actual forces, or will not give you the actual deformations of the structure. But you draw, you draw the structure, and the name is like that, sketch a frame. That's the name. It's free on, on, on the Apple Store. You, you, you develop a, a frame, and you, you decide what, whether it's fixed, it's spin, it's roll, vertical roll, horizontal roll, whatever it is, and you, and you choose it. Then in your joints, you decide whether the joints 
are fixed or the joints are capable of rotation. And then you apply different types of loads. And, and on the bottom part here, you, you show, you, you decide whether you want to see the deformation or whether you want, you want to see the movements. And, and, and let me tell you, it, it's wonderful for just checking out what would be the best layout uh, one way or the other. Uh, it, it's great for students. It's great for if you haven't designed in some time and aren't going to design back. It'll give you structural behavior. It's a, it's a beauty of a program. It's a product of, a, of the doctoral th thesis. I think it was Norway or something like that. And that's why it's for free. And so I strongly recommend it. It's really a beauty. So and as, as you know, uh, the, the distribution of the loads from, because of an earthquake is a quite complicated matter. Uh, when you do um, building design and you're doing a full 3D frame analysis, et cetera, but since this is simplified, we go back to the old method that were uh, used around the world in, in, the, in the 70s and the 60s, where, where you just estimate uh, a scalar value of the stiffness of a particular wall. And, and you, we use simple theory of, of inertia to to locate the walls, and, and this is the identification we see of a random wall. You need to know the distance of the, of the center of the wall from whatever axis you choose in both directions, x and y. You have the distance, and then you have to determine what is the geometric center of the, of the floor, and then what is the stiffness center of the wall. I have used uh, this guide for, for several uh, courses, teaching courses, you use a spreadsheet, it's instant, the result, it's very simple, it really works. In terms of this, uh, this is a, a beauty. After the 1985 um, Viña del Mar earthquake in Chile, the earthquake community was uh, totally impressed by the result of the Chilean building behavior. Of, of, of all of uh, those of you who are old enough remember that the walls were prohibited in the UVC for, re, for uh, re, uh, resisting earthquakes. Um, everything changed after 1985, uh, Viña del Mar earthquake in Chile, because there were thousands of buildings that were not designed for earthquake. They were made out with walls, and they resisted the earthquake. So Professor Sosen, and, and then uh, um, a young PhD student, Professor Sharon Wood, our actual ACI president, was part, part of this study in Viña del Mar. And, and what they determined is that, uh, that there is a proportion of the amount of walls in, a, 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 in relation from the amount of walls to the area of the building. So there are some indexes that, that you calculate, and, and if there is a minimum area of the walls, the building will behave adequately in an earthquake. So the, the simplification on this guide is that you take the shear of the building and divide it by the concrete resistance that you're going to design for the square root, and that will give you an area that needs to be three quarters of that area. The, 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 the summary of all the lengths times the width of the walls have to be greater than this, this amount. Okay. And that is simplified. As long as I comply with that, I have a stable earthquake resistant uh, building. Very simple. There has been some concerns that for the fourth and five floors buildings, this number was a little bit too high on the calculations. And, and some, um, I have given seminars about this guide in 11 countries and several states in the United States. And there were some complaints about the number of walls. So, Committee 314, oh, I forgot to tell you that story, um, because I, I have a longer version of this session, and I have shortened it today, is that after IPS1 was done, uh, ACI decided to create a committee of simplified design, which is 314, and uh, we adopted the IPS1, and for that, it went through all the process of TAC, so there were several changes done, et cetera, to fully comply and make sure that what we were saying that it complied with 318, it did. Uh, on that process, now we are on the second, uh, on the second uh, revision of 314, and um, 
there were some complaints about the, the amount of walls that were required. So since 314 was going to a review, uh, it was decided to go back on what was the decision that the original IPS1 makers did on, on interpreting the Chilean formula, and then compare that to the, uh, what has been developed on the, on the uh, last, late, latest years, uh, what is called the Hassan and Sosen index that relates uh, number of walls versus the capacity of the building for, to resist. So uh, what, what was uh, developed, uh, the formula was originally developed by um, estimating what would be the, the drift of a building uh, in relation to the heights of the walls and the length of the wall based again in the, in the, in the soil factor and the acceleration, uh, the average acceleration. And basically what, what the, the formula was, you know, that there's each wall, you're talking about the floor area versus the amount of walls, you know, how much uh, in reference to that amount of floor area that wall is taken. You know? If you take a simple building like this, two walls, that means that the wall is going to take half of the load of the, of the building. So if you, if you plot what, it, what is the, this wall index, uh, the drift versus the wall index, and you take different values of height or length of the walls, you can see that when the wall index starts increasing, all the, all the lines go quickly down, and they're very similar, which means that as long as we are beyond this area, really, it's going to behave very well. So what we have to avoid is the, 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 this area here, so it means that if we could do, we are actually in IPS1, we were up front in here, we were three, three quarters of the value. So that was revised, and I'm, I'm just doing a simplified explanation of what went through uh, with uh, Luis Enrique Garcia. So we have reduced that instead of three quarters of the relationship between the shear and the square root of F prime C to half of the relationship. So the amount of walls required uh, the amounts of walls requ required uh, was past president Jim Kegley there at the door. The, it will be only uh, half, half of that amount. So we have reduced the amount of walls required by one third from the previous version. So that's, that's coming out late this year, the official version. There were some other things that were um, included in that revision for, that, that is coming out on, on 313. 314, the year 16. <laughs> I got confused with all the numbers. And this again is the it was uh, the revision for the revision for the slender, slenderness ratio is, is revised to be it have to be less than three over two three plus the number of, of stories over two. Other simplifications were done and in in the range of a flexural design that you can use the simplified formula uh, for flexural moment of 0.85 A, F, uh, D. You don't have to go through the process of, of calculating A because on the lower values, th those numbers are very similar. The, the same thing is, is going to, um, uh, in the areas of slabs and girder, simplifications. This is not the main topic. I just wanted to show you a small peek of the changes that will be coming on the new version now to be out by the summer. Okay, one of the beauties of this guide is that you know the formulas of development lengths and splice lengths are terrible in 318, very complicated nowadays. So in, in this guide, it's very simple. The splice is 50 times the diameter of the bar. That's it, up to number eight bars. And the development lengths uh, on, on a hook are me measured from, from the face of the section to the other side of the section, and there has to be 25 bar diameters. That's the only rule that you have to remember. Very simple. If you follow the rule, you comply with 318. This is the, the splice, and this is just a recommendation for if you're using wire mesh. Uh, the recommendation is two cross wires to be sitting on top of each other. This is diagrams, again. One of the beauties of, the guide, of this guide is that there's a diagram for everything. So, so there's uh, no, no problem 
understanding the, the specifications. You see here the 25 diameters on a column beam in, uh, intersections. This is in the, in the corner, and this is in the foundation. The, the same rule applies. Okay. Let me tell you, in my years as expert witness, I have seen so many failures for footing column interaction because somehow, magically, structural engineers forget that the column bars have to have development lengths on the footing. They put development lengths everywhere in the, build, in the building, but they kind of forget, oh, 12-inch 12, 12 footing is okay. No, it has to be able. If you are saying that the column is development moment with the foundation, there has to be enough embedment lengths for the column bars so that you can guarantee that there's going to be a moment uh, transmission. Unfortunately, I have seen a, seen a lot of that in my expert witness years. The Fletcher, the, the guide as 318, used the Whitney approach. To me, uh, to me, there are two gods in structural analysis uh, and concrete design is Hardy Cross and, and, and Whitney. And, and if a young engineer wants to work for me, they, can you do moment distribution? No, eh, you're not the guy. If you don't understand moment distribution, you don't understand behavior. And I, I think it's essential. You can use whatever package you want to use, but you have to understand uh, moment distribution. And then Whitney is a magic formula because uh, he was able to develop a simplified way of establishing the balance between concrete compression and, 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 and reward tension with something that is magically a cartoon of what actually happens. But we have worked for 60 or 70 years now, and, and buildings doesn't fail because of that. And why do I say it's a cartoon? Because we have a, a, a rectangular uniform pressure on the top, stresses disappear, and then we have the tension on the river and below. And, and that's what basic, basically Whitney, Whitney, uh, Whitney's formula is, is to concentrate the compression on top, and we create the balance that makes the capacity for flexible moment between the pair of forces developed between that compression rectangle and, and the tension. You know. So it's an, a cartoon of what the actual behavior is, but believe me, it works. It works so well that we even use it in biaxial column design, even though it's no longer a rectangular, it's a triangle somewhere to get the biaxial, but that's, that's another story. And then this is showing you one of those little 495 programs from the iPad. Uh, and you enter on this side the dimensions that you're looking for. It will give you the results with the moments that you are, you are putting. It will graphically design, uh, show you what you're inputting. So you change the dimensions, the, 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 the graphic sh changes, so that, that you can see if you're doing it correctly. Then it will draw you the bars that he designs with, with your loads and, and show them to you. And it will give you all the diagrams of stresses, blah, blah. It's, the output is three or four pages. It's a beautiful program. Uh, there are other simpler ones, but if you're a nerd like me, you, you love this program. It's, it's beautiful. All the calculations, and, and the thing is that the, there is not output in, in the old sense of a, of a printout. It gives you an actual calculation, like you were doing it by hand. Uh, the output is like a hand calculation itself. Then when we go to columns, those of you old enough remember the Parker simplified uh, collection of books, and, and he, he did uh, a wonderful thing. If you're going to do column design by hand, what he did is that for flexure, he would only use the significant bars that contribute to that flexure. If the moment is on the left right direction here, he would only use the extreme bars for that. If the moment goes uh, top to bottom here, we only use these bars and disregard the others for simplify of calculation. You can do it the right way, then you have to make a calculation of the actual contribution of each of the bars. Again, this is simplified design, so that's the way it's done. But it's even more beautiful than that. Instead of having a real moment interaction diagram, which is a, is a curve, you say, forget about it, let's do three points. And, and what are the three points? What is the capacity in tension? That's given by the steel. You know, steel resistance by the area of steel. The concrete capacity maximum flattened by the 80% rule. 
and then the, the balance. So, so those, you calculate three numbers. Again, you can have them in a spreadsheet, very simple. And it will give you a diagram triangular shape. And you can check the capacity of the column you are doing. It. Very simple way, very simplified, which brings me to another neat program <laughs> on, the, on the tablet, reinforced concrete. And I think this was four ninety nine nine ninety nine too. Uh, and believe me, it's a, it's a joy. It, rectangular, square columns, uh, monoaxial, biaxial, uh, round columns. I'm, I'm just showing just for, for, for fun the circular columns. And again, in a very graphic way, you just push the bottom how many bars you want, uh, and, and, and uh, what is the rebar number, how many bars if you want tide or spiral reinforcement for the column, and, and then you, you enter the values, and it will be drawing the column at the same time you enter in the value so that you see what you're doing. You put 16 bars, it will be 16 bars. If four bars, six bars, whatever. And then you're ready, and you push the bottom here, interact on there, and tra magically, instantly, no waiting. The diagram is there, 495. Is 499. And I'll give you the diagram and the plotted value of the loads that you have. You say, okay, I'm, I'm too conservative. And you can change the size or the reverse, <laughs> reverse size, whatever. Uh, it's a gorgeous application, gorgeous application. Again, so you can go back to the simplified. It works right away in an Excel uh, sheet. And then you can use this kind of programs that all of them, uh, as you can see here, the, the arrow on the top, you just push there, and we'll give you a printout in PDF, because this is, this is the beauty of it. You can email it to you and store it in Dropbox, whatever you, you want to do with that calculation, because you, you are able to in, input your project name, your office, the column that it is, whatever you can do. So, so you can do the column designs that way. OK. Floor system. Again, the guide has beautiful diagrams, color on, on how to choose the better floor system for your building. And um, it, it goes from, from slab column system, joist systems, slab on girders. Uh, I just want to make a comment. I, I recently went and visited a project of a um, repair project for a one way joist system. And the the parking has corrosion problems, and, and they decided to repair it. And they contracted a structural engineer. There's plenty of seats to the site, please. And they repair the building, the parking structure for corrosion. And the structural engineer decided to put a three to four inch topping to better move the waters on the, on the upper floor. The structural engineer never checked the actual strength of the column, of the, of, the, of the structure. So he used the value that was on the construction plans, 4,000 PSI, whatever. When after, shortly after they did rep the repair, the joist started cracking all over the parking. Some tests were done. The actual strength of the, of the concrete was half of what was on the plans. So the overload of the three to four inches uh, topping then caused shear failure on all the joists. And the problem was that they, uh, once one, two, three start cracking, then it's, it's like a domino principle. Everything else starts cracking because there's no way to stop it. So, so it's a tragedy. Anyhow, that's, I got sidetracked there, but I was impressed. Anyhow, one, again, the guide. The guide has a lot of diagrams and, and, and tries to, to show the designer of, of good practices through, through diagram. Uh, mechanical engineers always try to make holes in our beams. And here's a guide that the recommendation that the mechanical holes on the beam should be located uh, between the one fourth of the length of the span and one third of the length of the span e either side. And the, the size or vertical size of that hole should not exceed one third of the actual height of the beam. The, the beam. Again, protecting the compression uh, regions of the beam, etc. So, so it's, this is 
One, I'm just showing you to one of the diagrams, beautiful diagrams that the manual has. Slabs, the same layout that we have for 318, but again, simplified. Don't, don't forget about calculating the A. We, we can calculate the stress. For cantilevers on, on buildings, the, the guide is a little bit more strict than 318 because of the experience that they put a lot of stuff on the cantilevers in the commercial buildings. Uh, they change the facades, or they put air conditions on the, on the cantilevers, etc. So the, the recommendation of the guide is to half of the load uh, applied distributed and the other half as a concentrated load uh, on, the, on the end of the cantilever to be able to calculate, uh, uh, design the, the reinforcement for the cantilever using that formula. And another beautiful diagram, and, and probably those uh, who have seen um, uh, slab, concrete slabs and there are two walls and, and uh, intersecting walls, they will develop a diagonal crack on that corner. Why? Because even though it may be a one-way slab or a two-way slab, the reforms will always be perpendicular to, to, to the walls. Uh, the truth is that structures behave by, by behavior, not by, by the way the structural engineers want to do it. I have a very stiff corner on both sides, and the, the concrete will try to support itself from both sides, not the side that you decided. So if you follow this detail, this detail uh, for, for diagonal reinforcement, you won't have that crack. And you can see in several structures the crack that develops in the corner. Then um, for, uh, this is showing you a one-way slab. The guide doesn't ask you to go and calculate the inflection points. Since the guide has limits on, on its size, et cetera, it automatically gives you where to cut or not. For, for top rebar, it allows you to um, split the bars in two, in two, half and half. One of them will extend to one third of the span, and the other will uh, extend to one fourth of the span, alternate. And that will be enough for, for the inflection point. In terms of the uh, bottom bar, uh, it recommends the splice on the center, uh, on, on top of the, sorry, beams. So it's, it's really very um, a graphic, the way to show the user. And it recommends, which is very important, even in supported uh, or cantilevers, always to have a top bar at the end, uh, both in the cantilever or in the beam, because there always be. Uh, in, in this area, will help develop resistance to the formation. And here, it will always take uh, a certain amount of moment, whether we like it or not. And, Otherwise, if you don't put the rebar, a crack will show near, near, near the, the other beam. Then I almost cry when I see the approach of this book uh, toward two-way slabs. Uh, in 1963, ACI 318 code, these tables were there for two-way slabs. As we modernize, and I'm not mentioning names, and a new, someone in 318 promoted a more complex way of doing two-way slabs. And at that point, they have not failed because of using those formulas. <laughs> there were some issues on, on the minimum thickness, but not on the flexure. So uh, how these charts work? And I'm just showing you here an example of a two-way slab that has a, a, is in on the edge of the building and has the other three continuous edges. And what you do with the chart is that you enter here uh, the, the, the span ratio long to, to, the short, uh, uh, to the short ratio, so it goes from one to two. And, and why it limits to two? Because after two, it no longer behaves like a two-way slab. It doesn't matter the proportion you want to do, it will be, be behaving by, by, uh, like a one-way slab. So you enter your ratio, let's say, uh, and you can see uh, here on, on the negative moment, it goes from one sixteenth go down, to one tenth, not much of a variation, but then uh, on, on the other side of the of the diagram, you can see it goes to uh, one over thirty-three to one over three hundred thirty. So it's basically no moment at all, depending if if almost two, then the negative moment on the other side is almost non-existent. So that's uh, 
So it's very easy. It will give you the, the negative moment. It will give you the, the positive moment and what is called the load fraction in, in that process, which is for determining the shear forces that you will apply uh, to, to the beams. And this is shows you the behavior uh, of the moments between the two ways left. It goes smaller toward the ends, et cetera. Garden beams and joist. Another beautiful diagram to the interconnection between the joist beam and the girder beam requires special reinforcement, again, to prevent shear uh, uh, cracks, etc., on the girder beam. And there's recommendations of a set of, uh, of, of additional stirrups to be located in the intersection of the, of the beam and the girder beam. And it has some formula to calculating that amount of extra uh, stirrups that are required to guarantee, again, the same comment I made at the foundation, to guarantee that there is a transfer of load between that intermediate beam and, and the girder beam. The same way that there was for the slab, the same thing here is a diagram for the girder, again, uh, avoiding the designer to calculate uh, the inflection points, et cetera, of, uh, of the to where to cut off or not the, the reinforcement, and I'm not going to go over it, but it's one third, one eighth, et cetera. Then something very important to, to not, not leave unattended is, again, since you're doing calculations by hand, is to don't, don't forget the unbalanced moment. If you have in a, in a top beam an unbalanced moment between the negative moments, the column will have to take care of that, otherwise, there will be no equilibrium. So, so don't, don't forget about there has to be equilibrium in the system. Because the guide simplifies it away. You, you don't have to calculate slenderness ratio or drift indexes for, for the building. Remember, we are doing shear walls for, for lateral resistance. So, so it's a limit of height, uh, the size of the columns based on the, uh, on the height of the column itself. And as long as you comply with those dimensions, you're fully compliant with, with, the, with the slenderness ratio of the columns. This is the diagram. Again, the guide is full of sketches. This is the, di the diagram of the splices and location of, of, of stirrups for columns that are uh, in regions where there's no earthquakes. And you can see that the splices are, can be done just, a floor, just above the floor. And, and the, the 318 recommendation that they should be alternate, that you don't have all the rebars being spliced at the same level. In terms of an earthquake region, it's quite different. We, we want the splices to occur at mid-height. Again, because of the, if there is a moment because of the earthquake developed on the column, the inflection point is at the center of the column, and that's the best place to do the splice because you don't have moments. So you want to have the, the node area, the inter integration of column and beam to be free of the cluttering, the, the splicing of, of rebars. Uh, agree. So then don't forget that the column exists down to the bottom of the foundation. And sometimes there is an intermediate slab. You have to take care of that inflection point, and then you have the, the, the foundation. And this become very important, particularly if you're using uh, uh, mat foundations or pile caps, et cetera, which is much rigid, the structure. So that transfer of moment is very important. The, don't forget that, uh, I think 20 years ago, the 318 required some special stirrups at the column joint. When I started as a structural engineer, there were no requirements. It was like an empty pocket, <laughs> the interaction between the column and the beam. So there's a need, uh, and the, the, this is the layout, the graphic layout, and then there's the calculations to it that is included in the guide how to do it. Seismic resistance, we cannot forget that the uh, moments that are induced in the beams by the earthquake, there the, has to be, again, a balance. Uh, of the of the forces, so they create cheers to to counteract that that moment that needs to be resisted by the by the by the by the beam. So not only you have the the shear caused by the gravity loads, but you have the shear caused by the unbalance of the earthquake moment, which gives us that in the earthquake regions we have to in the joint determine that shear, how you transfer it. Again, there has to be a continuity of the forces. We say there is a additional moments on the beam because of the earthquake. That shear has to be transferred through the joint itself. 
The, the guide has beautiful diagrams um, to help you identify the area that is contributing to the resistance of the shear. For example, in this diagram itself, the beam is much wider than the column itself. So the limitation of that area is the column size. You cannot use the beam size because there is no transfer. So it's limited to the area of interaction between the column and the beam. Okay? And it has different diagrams of different situations, et cetera, in, in the guide. Um, on the walls, e, the boundary elements that were introduced into the code some, some time ago, uh, it behaves like a classic P over A over 6M over 6EI, which is the, the simplification 6M over LB, which is the, the for, for walls. And, and the triggering, the same as 318, if you're doing just a one story to story, probably you will need to do a boundary element. The, the, the trigger is to check if, if the seismic effect is larger than 20% of F prime C that you're using. My recommendation, if you're very close, better increase <laughs> the F prime C. It will be a cheaper project for the world. And um, this is just the definition of areas of the boundary elements at the end, the calculation of the area requiring the interiors of the wall, is similar, uh, exactly the way that 318 does it, but here we have diagrams to show you how to use it. In terms of the core walls, whether they are elevator cores or stair cores that they are used, that I know in the United States, there's a big practice of doing this in reinforced uh, masonry walls. I think in earthquake region, that's a terrible decision uh, because I have seen blast structures from gas explosions. I have seen a lot of earthquake, no, not the earthquake, the aftermath of the earthquakes. And whenever there was a core, a core system for wall, for, for elevators, or for stairs, man, those, those things went beyond their duty in maintaining stability in the structure. And, and it's a pity, you know, is this not an earthquake region? Okay, but if it's an earthquake region, forget about do, using CMU to closing down the elevator. Use them in, with concrete. Take the advantage. This, they are just like a spinal cord in, in that um, building. So it, here is very simple. We, we design individually the walls. We add a, a boundary elements in the inter intersections and, uh, and the ends of the walls. And uh, you have to be cautious on, on which direction you are considering the moment because it has different effects. Here we have when we have the moment that causes uh, compression and tension on, on, the, on the webs of the core and, and uh, on the flange. It's, uh, it's very simple, the approach. When the web, web are in compression, you just design them like, like a beam, like a regular wall we showed you before. If, if the web is in tension, uh, it will use, design it as a T-beam. That's, that's what the, the guide allows, very simple. You calculate the reinforcement and, and that's it. And, and foundations, it has values, different type of foundations, combined footings. This is a regular spread foundation. Uh, it gives you the diagram, and all the diagrams, how to calculate the shear, uh, one-way shear, two-way shear. All the diagrams are there for uh, uplift, how to recalculate the, the footing, etc. how to do that. And then there's this beautiful program that I mentioned to you at the beginning. Uh, again, I think this is, uh, I think, a $9.99 do, uh, program. As you can see here, the menu on, on, the, on, the, le on the left, it has uh, spread footing, bearing capacity, settlement, single pile capacity, pile group capacity, retaining wall stability, et cetera, et cetera. It's beautiful, you enter the dimensions, until it will calculate the, the reinforcement and everything and, do, and draw you <laughs> the, the, the foundation result. Not only give you the results, it will give you the footing in scale and proportion. Uh, everything is according to what you design and, and the size of the pier that you input, and then it will give you the reverse in each direction. It's, it's a beautiful program. Uh, excellent, excellent. So, so you can do it by hand. You have an iPad, you can quickly do it <laughs> using the, the... And I show you these things to, to remember you that uh, you can use technology with, with this simplified guide, and, and I have to finish. 
Uh, one of the beauties of, of this guide, I, I told you that like a pilot, there is a checklist for everything. This is the checklist, I'm, I'm just showing it for information, for the structural drawings. Uh, remember that you put dimensions, elevation, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's beautiful. The, the, so the young engineer or, or someone that doesn't design all the time, is a good checklist. In terms of construction, this is just a table for those who are not so knowledgeable of concrete. This is the effect on slump of different materials. So to give you an example, in terms of, um, I'm, not, I'm sorry, different um, properties of concrete, uh, like slump. Well, what is the effect of uh, cement? Reduces the slump. Fine aggregate reduces the slump. Coarse aggregate increases the slump. Water increases the slump. So this is a good, very nice chart uh, to help engineers understand uh, the concrete behavior. And a structure. This is the curing time for different types of application. More and more sketches where to do joints for beams, etc. Uh, gives guidance on that. And um, for non-believers that we comply, there's a reference, chapter 17, of all the uh, reference document that this uh, 314 guide does. And that's the end. Almost took the hour. Almost. Feeling short of 55 minutes so that people can take a break or ask questions. Any questions? Yeah. A couple of questions. First one is, why five floors? Why not four? Why not six? Was there any study on that? And the second one is cost. I mean, if you compare a fully designed with ACI creating similar building versus the simplified, was there a study on the additional cost? Sure. The so cost? I'll tell you all the number of floors. Oh, I don't have coins in my pocket. So at the end, it should be five or six. Five, no, no, I'm just kidding. Some committee decisions are made like that here in ACI, although people don't believe it. No, at the end, we, we were looking at not, not a, a guide to do big structures. That 318 is, is for that. And, and we, there were some very important studies for, from PCA on, on the size of buildings through the United States. And there was some, some data in Latin America on size of buildings, and, and it was determined that, uh, because if you go beyond that, you start getting some other problems in terms of the walls, etc. So, so five was chosen because of what building sizes they were built uh, in great amount of numbers in the United States and, and America, and, and five was the consensus limit imposed into the manner. Would it work for six? Probably yes, but that's the limit we throw in. Uh, and your other commentary was in, uh, okay. The, the buildings designed with this manual uh, guide, um, they keep, ACI changed once it was adopted by ACI, it's a guide, a guide of 314 guide. Uh, it's within 5% for non-earthquake areas. For earthquake areas, uh, the higher you went, the number difference increased because of the wall areas. And that's something that by this change, we, we approve. We hope to keep it, uh, the calculation we have made is between 6 and 7% in, in, air, in earthquake areas. So if you see the 350 pages of 318 versus this, which has a lot of pages, but because of diagrams, we, th we, we are very happy that we'll guarantee safe structures at a reasonable price and will help engineers to be able and feel capable of designing a structure in a very trustworthy way that it's, it's terrifying. If you don't use 318 every day, the truth is that 318 is, is terrifying. Any other question? Sort of in, a, in a similar vein, I can understand the question about the height because uh, it's very important to allow that. What about the, the floor plate, the size? Because actually 10,000 square feet is relatively small um, uh, in terms of low building. Many, many low buildings spread out much more. Where, where did that come from? Well, there was a parametric study on the size and proportions, and uh, that's uh, um, now that now that you bring that issue, I, I remember that issue has been brought to me before. So that's something that we need to bring back to 314, because we we may be able to to because that not not a, such a big problem the size, the spans yes, because once you go beyond 30 feet, uh, really 
concrete solutions are other. You should you pose tension and stuff like that, which, which is not uh, the intention of this guide. It's for regular structures. Just to follow up on that, I think we brought up in the committee that we expand that in, in the North American market to an acre. You know, an acre is a little bit bigger, so almost double the size that you're talking about. One slide. I, I question why, too, because I think a lot more buildings, low rise structures in the North America are a little bit bigger than what you find around, around the world. I will take note and, and see if we can uh, increase that. But I, I agree. No, no, I agree. I agree with you. Thank you very much.